Titans Away Tonight. I'm Scott Pelley. We begin tonight with a surprising development in the sex abuse scandal in the Roman Catholic Church. For decades, priests in this country have abused children in parish after parish while their superiors covered it all up. Now it turns out the orders for this cover-up were written in Rome at the highest levels of the Vatican. Correspondent Vince Gonzalez has uncovered a church document kept secret 40 years until now. The confidential Vatican document obtained by CBS News lays out a church policy that calls for absolute secrecy when it comes to sexual abuse by priests. Anyone who speaks out could be thrown out of the church. The policy was written in 1962 by Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani, seen here crowning Pope Paul VI. The document, once stored in the secret archives of the Vatican, focuses on crimes initiated as part of the confessional relationship and what it calls the worst crime, sexual assault committed by a priest or attempted by him with youths of either sex or with brute animals. Bishops are instructed to pursue these cases in the most secretive way, restrained by a perpetual silence, and everyone, including the alleged victim, is to observe the strictest secret, which is commonly regarded as a secret of the holy office under the penalty of excommunication. This document is significant because it's a blueprint for deception. Larry Javon says this proves what he has alleged on behalf of victims in priest abuse lawsuits that the church engaged in a crime, racketeering. It's an instruction manual on how to deceive and how to protect pedophiles and how to avoid the truth coming out. The idea that this is some sort of blueprint to keep this secret is simply wrong. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops says the document is being taken out of context, that it's a church law that deals only with rare internal trials of religious crimes and sins, and that the secrecy is meant to protect the faithful from scandal. This is... The historic ecumenical council, Vatican II, comes to a close amid colorful pomp and pageantry. Considered one of the most important councils in Catholic Church history, Vatican II produced 16 documents designed to modernize the role of the Church in world affairs. The final blessing is for the assembled throng and for the world. Ite in pace, go in peace. With those words, Pope Paul VI closed the Second Vatican Council. Little did anyone realize what lay ahead. The decades since Vatican II have been turbulent. Its history spans centuries, but its future is uncertain. The Roman Catholic Church is a church in crisis. How do the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church compare with the teachings of sacred scriptures? The Mass is the center of Catholic experience, and all Catholics are required to attend each week. Jesus Christ instructed his followers to take bread and wine as a remembrance of him. But unlike most Christian denominations, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the bread and wine are more than symbolic. The priest actually transforms the bread into the body of Christ. A miraculous change is about to take place. Catholic doctrine teaches that the wafer is no longer bread, but is now the actual body of Jesus Christ and is to be worshipped and adored as divine. I, I always kind of wondered about that because as a priest you lean over the bread and you say this is my body and you're trained to believe that that became the body of Jesus and you lift it up for people to uh, to uh, adore and whatever and you do that with the chalice too but in my mind I always thought I can't see any change and, and do I really have the power to do this 
It smells like bread, it looks like bread, it tastes like bread, but the substance is really the body of Jesus. How can the church maintain a change takes place despite all external evidence to the contrary? It uses a theory called transubstantiation. Catholic theologian, Father John Boyle of the Jesuit School of Theology. So we, transubstantiation simply means that what before was bread and wine, uh, down deep now is the body and blood of Christ. And we take that physically because we're physical and it's the physicality of life. The church bases transubstantiation upon the teachings of Aristotle. His third century BC concept of matter viewed everything as consisting of two parts, accidents and substance. Accidents are described as the outward appearance of matter. Substance is the inner essence. Even though this idea has long since been discarded by modern science, the Catholic Church not only clings to it, but takes it one step further, claiming the inner essence can change while the outward appearance remains the same. Transubstantiation is the foundation upon which the Mass rests. Catholics are taught that the priest must change the bread so that Christ can be offered as a real sacrifice, an offering for the sins of the living and the dead. It is the actual sacrifice of the Mass that the body and blood of Christ is actually being uh, sacrificed right there on the altar rather than just a reenactment of something that happened many thousands of years ago. And this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. After those who are called to this table. Is the Eucharist a real sacrifice? A Catholic would say that the Eucharist is a real sacrifice in that the Eucharist is the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. That this is not a different sacrifice from the one Jesus made on Calvary. It is the same sacrifice. Now that goes directly against Scripture because in Hebrews 10, 18 it says that with the forgiveness of, with the forgiveness of these there is no longer any offering for sin. There is no more offering. Catholic priest Father Richard Chilson is the author of eight books on the Catholic faith, including Catholic Christianity and an introduction to the faith of Catholics. We asked him why the Catholic Church seeks to continue the sacrifice of Jesus at the Mass. The Eucharist for a Catholic is ultimately a mystical understanding, that there is what we call real time and then there is what John calls the hour. And the hour is present in every moment if we can if we can open our eyes to that, that reality. And so the Eucharist, by, by making present that, that sacrifice throughout history, hopes, helps, to, helps us to open our eyes to what is really going on continually, that, that God is continually, through Jesus Christ, reconciling the universe to, to himself. It allows us to personally come into that that moment and be reconciled with God again and again and again. For a Catholic, it continues before the sacrifice of Calvary. That it, the sacrifice of Calvary does not begin at that point. It begins really at the foundation of the world. It, it goes forward in history and it goes backward in history as well. Other Christian denominations celebrate that the sacrifice is finished. We asked Father Chilson why the Catholic Church chooses to focus on its continuing. Why not leave it finished? I don't know if I can answer that. Not make for yourself an idol or a statue or a picture in the form of anything in heaven above, in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Victor Afonso served as a Jesuit priest for 21 years. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. It's the same word. Though part of the Ten Commandments in the Catholic Bible, the Catholic Church regularly omits this command from catechisms. Yet it still comes up with ten. And how come they still got ten? They took the last one, which is, Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not, co uh, not set your desire on the neighbor's house or land. His ma manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. They divided this into two. They made nine, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife and ten thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's goods. So they had the Ten Commandments. Now this is crookery. This is trickery. You've changed the commandment. But why did you drop the second commandment? Because there's a lot of business in making statues.